So um, thank you everyone for joining. It's uh, exciting to have this uh, webinar format kicked off. Um, and I'm excited to present uh, our first speaker, David Honey. Uh, David is an expert uh, with, uh, who's a seasoned expert in uh, jazz and OSLC. He has been a longtime member of the uh, technical committee uh, before and uh, the current open project uh, member. Uh, he is the editor for the configuration management spec and he authored configuration management primer. And it's a pleasure and honor to have him walk us through the configuration management specification. With that, David, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Andrew, for those uh, <laughs> glowing, glowing references. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Um, what I'm going to go through is um, a primer and I've got some additional slides um, one of the challenges I think people face when looking at specifications is that they tend to be um, rather normative documents that are not very tutorial in nature. And that sometimes makes it difficult to understand the specifications. So um, I, I wrote a primer that tries to provide a much more tutorial um, way of, of getting into the specifications. So the, the document that I'm displaying, first of all, is, is the, the current primer. Um, well, I'm not going to go through all of the primer. Um, I'm just going to hit the, the main points. I would encourage, if you have any questions, I would prefer to, you know, that people ask them there and then um, so that we can answer them in context. But if you don't want to do that, we can take those offline and uh, deal with those afterwards. OK, so the, the primer itself, um, as I say, it's, it's a non-normative document. Uh, as with most primers, um, the, the specification itself remains the definitive reference. Um, I'm not aware of any cases where the primer would conflict with what the spec says, but if there are any, then it's obviously the specification is the authoritative source rather than the primer. Um, we can see here a table, a table of contents. Um, I'm going to go through the concepts part actually through slides because I think um, trying to understand some of these concepts um, is perhaps a bit easier with some examples. Um, so I'm going to switch across to some uh, to a PowerPoint presentation that I've got. Um, and I think the first thing we'll do is, is talk about some, some terminology um, uh, so that at least we're familiar with uh, what we mean when we talk about things like components and selections and contributions and so forth. Um, most of these terms are defined in the specification, but I thought it worth to that we go through these um, right at the start here. So first term, components. Um, it's really a way of grouping together sets of version resources into something that makes logical sense. So, for example, if you're um, if you're in the automotive space, then a component might represent, for example, a transmission um, or an engine or an infotainment system and something of, of that, that nature. Um, and so the, the component groups together the sets of artifacts, um, many of which might be versions. Um, that belong to that component. So you've got, um, you might have a set of requirements, for example, that defines the requirements for the infotainment system components of a vehicle. Um, a configuration identifies the set of versions uh, of resources um, that are going to be used um, in that uh, configuration. So it's effectively saying a configuration is, is a way of saying, um, I've got a particular uh, flavor of the components. So if I've got my infotainment system, I might have an infotainment system, say for 2021, or for a given release of product. Um, and I might have a, a different configuration representing the 2022 version of that infotainment system. And it's the configuration 
that then identifies what are the right versions of resources in that infotainment system for 2022 versus 2021. And so configuration is, is always of some component. Uh, next term is selections. Um, this is a resource that references the versions of resources selected by configuration. So although configuration identifies a set of versions, um, really what happens is when we look at the representation uh, is that a configuration references uh, one or, or more selections resources and it's the selection resources that actually reference the um, version of members of that uh, configuration. Uh, contributions. Um, when we start to build configurations into a hierarchy of configurations, and um, we'll talk about that later, um, the contribution, a contribution represents a configuration that contributes to a parent configuration. So I, I might aggregate configurations into a hierarchy, um, and each of those contributed configurations uh, will be a contribution to um, some kind of parent configuration. And again, we'll look at some examples of that. Now, a configuration itself is typically of uh, one of three subtypes. Um, we have streams, baselines, and chain sets. Those are the three principal types of configuration. Um, a stream, um, think of a stream as being where you do your day-to-day -day work. So a stream is a set of selections and contributions that may be modified. So for example, I might previously have a stream that selects version one of some requirement, and then I make a change to that requirement. And now um, uh, the stream gets updated to uh, select the new version two of that requirement that I might have created. So your, your stream is essentially your, your workspace. That's where you, you make your ongoing changes for a particular purpose. A baseline, on the other hand, is a configuration whose selections or contributions may not be modified. And so typically, um, when you're going through working on a particular stream, there'll be points in time that represent significant milestones. Um, and, and so what you do is that you'll create a baseline from the stream to capture the set of versioned artifacts that were in the stream at that point in time. And because that baseline, um, its selections or contributions may not be modified, that becomes a, an audit record, um, a record of what was in the stream at the time the baseline was created. And the third type of configuration is a chain set. And this is a configuration representing a related set of changes. Um, chain sets um, are, are quite a familiar term. If you've if, you're, um, if you've used, uh, for example, uh, uh, GitHub, you, you'll know that you'll effectively deliver a set of changes and effectively the collection of those changes is a chain set. Or if you've used um, um, the rational EWM tool for, um, for source code control, you'll come across the term chain set there, which pretty much represents the same kind of thing. Uh, last two terms, version resource and concept resource. Um, so you might have, a, uh, for example, a requirement, and there might be multiple versions of that requirement. And so we tend to use the term concept resource to represent all of the versions of some resource, such as a requirement or test case. And then a version resource represents a specific version of that concept resource. And we'll see how concept resources and version resources play out in, uh, in, in some of the following slides. Um, any questions on terminology before I move on to the next slide? Okay, not hearing anything, I'll move on. Um, talk a little bit about local configuration management. So um, typically, if you're working in a, a tool, tool that supports configuration management, supports versioning, you know that application, whether it's requirements management, test management, uh, code management, model management, 
will manage the versions of its local artifacts, um, whatever those, those artifacts are. Um, but it will also manage local configurations, things like streams and baselines, each of which will select the right versions of those uh, versioned resources. So typically in those tools, developers and content authors work in streams and whenever they save or deliver a change, there's a new version of the change resources are created and the stream is then updated to select that new version. And as I previously mentioned, if you want to um, create a, um, a record of what was in the stream at a point in time, you create a baseline from that stream. And now you have a baseline that represents the stream selections at the time uh, when the baseline was created. So just trying to put that into to context within a, a, an application that supports configuration management. Any questions on this slide before I move to the next? Okay, not hearing any. So I, I thought I'd expand this example and say, okay, well, what happens when we start to work on artifacts in different applications? And the example that I'm showing here on this slide is where I have um, uh, my, my test cases uh, being managed within the rational engineering test management application and requirements in DOORS Next. And so um, in the engineering test management tool, I might have a particular test case, uh, test case uh, TC1. And in a given ETM stream uh, within that application, uh, that would select, for example, version one of that test case. And I might have a um, a requirement, uh, R1 in DOORS Next, and there'll be a corresponding DOORS Next stream that selects, for example, version two of that requirement, wh whatever version is appropriate in that stream. So in, in each of the applications, there is a, a local configuration uh, that selects the appropriate versions of artifacts in that configuration context. So an ETM if a user selects ETM stream one as their configuration context, when they look at TC1, test case TC1, they'll see version one. Now it's important to note at this point in the story, we, we have a configuration context that I can use in each of the two tools that allows me to see the right versions of things in that tool. But there is no single configuration context in which users could see the appropriate versions of test cases and requirements. So typically a test case might validate a requirement, but I can't see there is no configuration context here that I could use to uh, see what is, the um, what is the test case that validates requirement R1. So this is, this is where the, the story we'll move on to, and we'll start talking about how we do linking across version artifacts um, in the uh, RCC config management uh, spec. Any questions on this slide before I move on to the next? Okay, not hearing any. David, I did have a question. I couldn't get to my mute button quick enough. All right. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, Jim. Hello. Uh, so um, if you tried to create a link from a test case to a requirement in this situation that you've got here with two local configurations, what would happen? Would it, would it refuse to create the link? I, I, I don't think you can. I, I don't think you can create a link because there is no way to, 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 to work out, well, what is the right version of the other artifact yeah. that I want to reference? Because I don't have a configuration context that allows me to do that. That's right. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to talk a little bit about linked data in general. Um, I've got a reference there. I won't read out the words. There's a W3C reference about explaining what is linked data. And I got a link, um, a link there to um, the jazz.net wiki page that talks about some best practices for linked data. Um, what I just wanted to mention is some typical kinds of 
example links between artifacts, especially between different applications. So it, it's very common that that um, that people want to create a link between test cases and requirements so that you can say this test case validates a particular requirement. Um, you might have um, in your requirements tool, you might have a satisfies type of relationship that um, will say that uh, one requirement satisfies another requirement. So it's, it's quite common to start off with, uh, for example, general um, uh, um, sort of top high level requirements and you might want to decompose those into finer grained requirements for particular um, components. And so you might want to have a satisfied relationship where the lower level um, component specific requirement satisfies perhaps some higher level system requirement. Um, and you might also want to have links from change requests or work items um, referencing the requirement. Um, so you can say that the um, I have a particular requirement that implements um, something that's described in a work item. There are many other types of relationships, but these are just some examples to illustrate the fact that you might have links between um, to either to or from version artifacts, some of which might be to um, artifacts in different applications. Now, if you're creating links between versioned um, artifacts, of course, there, there's a couple of ways in which you, you, you might do this. I, I should actually make sure I put myself into presentation mode, actually, because I've got some animation for this slide. So let's imagine that I, I, I decide to link to explicit versions of artifacts, and I create a link from test case one, version one, to requirement R1, version one. And let's say that I, I've got this validates requirement relationship. Well, what, it, what happens if I create a new version of the requirements? I've got a requirement version two, and it's likely um, that the user wants to reference that new version from test case version one, uh, test case uh, one. Um, now, the, the, the challenge here is in order to do that, the user would have to create a new version of TC1 because we're changing the contents of TC1 in order to reference um, the version two of the requirement. So while such a representation is certainly possible, it's, it's, it's permitted, this is not a good implementation because it, it, it means that users have to create new versions of the source artifacts in order to then uh, modify the link to point to different versions of other artifacts. Um, so in the RSLC config management specification, the recommendation is, is not to do this. And instead, um, that you we, we start to have links to what are called concept resources. So rather than doing that, um, in the config management spec, the, the recommendation is links are always to concept resources. So I might have version one of, of test case one, TC1, but what I link to is the concept resource requirement R1, not a particular version of that requirement. So now again, I create a new version of that requirement and um, what, we're, what we're going to see is that we're going to use the configuration context for that link to resolve to a particular version. And that's what I've got on the, the next slide. So after I've created the new version of, of um, requirement R1, I've got version two that's selected by a particular door's next stream. Um, I need to have some way of resolving in the, my test management tool, my quality management tool, I need to have some way of resolving the link from test case one to a particular version of requirements. And we use this idea of a configuration context to do that. Now, as I've mentioned um, on a previous slide, we don't yet have a configuration context that allows us to resolve that link to the, con to the concept um, resource and resolve to a, a version of the requirements. Uh, 
And this is where the idea of global configurations comes in. So imagine that we, we create a thing called a global configuration. Um, and a global configuration is, is really just a, a way of aggregating um, local configurations. And so we're going to create a, a new a global configuration stream, GC stream one, that has contributions from both our test management um, stream one and our doors next stream one streams, grouping those together as contributions. Now, in the context of that global stream, uh, within the engineering test management tool, users will see um, version one of the test case, and in doors next, users will see version two of the requirement because we have a global configuration context that includes the ETM stream and the doors next stream. And as we saw on the previous slide, in, in the ETM stream, we have version one of the test case, and in uh, uh, doors next, that stream selects version two of the requirement. And that, that allows the user in the uh, ETM tool to see the link to version two of the requirements and indeed can navigate to view that version in doors next and, and preserve the configuration context. Or you could view the, uh, you could view the link in doors next and see which test case was pointing to it and navigate back to ETM. So you've got round trip navigation within that global configuration context. So we've gone through quite a few slides here. Any, any, any questions on the last several slides when we, we talk about configuration context? Okay, not hearing any, I'll, I'll move on. Now, in the example I showed, it was a, a very simple global configuration. It just had two contributions, um, but you can also um, ha have global configurations having contributions from other global configurations. And then that, that allows users to construct hierarchies of configurations. So a very common usage pattern, again, if I use automotive as an example, I might have a particular car as my uh, top level global configuration, and I might want to break that down into uh, uh, child global configurations that represent things like engine, uh, transmission, chassis, um, infotainment, and so forth. And the benefit of breaking things down like that is then under the infotainment GC, I can then have contributions from um, doors next for the requirements of the infotainment system and an ETM for the test cases, test case uh, testing those requirements for the infotainment system and so on. So, it allows people to organize and group together um, related sets of local configurations for effectively a, a common subsystem or component of the vehicle. Now, sometimes there's a, a bit of confusion about, well, when is a configuration global and, and when is it local? Um, so I, I, on this slide, I'm, I, I, I'm trying to differentiate uh, the two. So a global configuration is really there. Its, its primary purpose is to be an aggregator of contributions from other applications. So typically a global configuration has contributions from doors next and ETM and you know any other tool like a modeling tool and so forth. Um, but they typically don't have version resources themselves. So they typically don't have selections. On the other hand, local configurations almost always have selections because their primary purpose is to manage the version artifacts from that application. So doors next manages requirements, which will be versioned. And so you'll have configurations in doors next that select the appropriate versions of requirements. And a local configuration cannot have contributions from configurations from other applications. Um, so one of the primary um, uh, discriminators or things that distinguish local from global is 
global aggregates contributions from other applications, but local configurations almost never do. Um, there isn't really a, um, a kind of black and white answer to that. To some extent, it's a little bit gray, but that's probably the easiest way to distinguish and differentiate local from global configurations. Okay, any questions on that slide? Okay, not hearing any. I think this might be my, it's not quite my last slide, almost the last slide. So if I selected a global configuration as my configuration context, how does an application resolve a, a concept resource such as requirement R1 to a particular version of that requirement. So this is giving you a, a kind of step-by-step -step, um, algorithm for doing this. So the first thing is that um, if we're looking at requirement R1 in Doors Next, Doors Next will know what is the component associated with requirement R1. And let's just say it's DN component one. Next, um, uh, the tool would get the contribution tree for the configuration context. And in, in, in the parentheses, I've shown for each configuration the corresponding component. So we can see that GC, GC Stream 1 ha has a contribution from ETM Stream 1 and also a contribution from Doors Next Stream 1. But we're looking for what is the configuration for Doors Next component one, and we can see it's Doors Next stream one. And so we, we traverse this tree in a particular order to find the first instance of that component. And then we can see the configuration that that, um, that, that resolves to. And then the last step is, oh, and, and I, I, I put down here, it's, it's based on a, um, it doesn't have to be in this order, but this is this is a, a, a typical implementation. Uh, you would typically traverse the tree depth first, and then within at any given level in the tree, you would then deal with the siblings um, based upon their order of contribution. Um, contributions are ordered. There's a contribution order property um, that is used to denote the relative ordering of contributions in a given configuration. Um, now, the order of traversal usually does not matter. If, if, for example, there's only one configuration of Doors Next component one in this hierarchy, the order that we traverse this tree has no effect on the outcome. The outcome would always be to choose Doors Next stream one. Um, but there are cases where that might matter um, and we'll possibly come on to that a bit later. But for, for most normal usage, um, the order of traversal actually shouldn't matter. And then finally, the application says, okay, I know which local configuration I should use, and I know the concept resource. And so um, using my local configuration management data, I know what is the right version of that requirement to select in this case, in our example, it's version two. Okay, any questions on this slide? Okay, I think this was my last slide. Oh, not quite, I've got one more component skew. <laughs> we'll talk about this one. Um, I've mentioned that under normal, um, usage, you, you typically only have one configuration of any component as a contribution in the GC hierarchy. But what if I've got two different configurations of the same component? So the, the slide here is showing I've got a, a global configuration stream one that has two different um, streams of uh, from ETM for the same ETM component one. So if I was looking at, well, which is the stream I should choose, 
for ETM component one, there's now a question of do I choose stream one or stream two of, for that component? Um, and this case is called component skew. I, I have more than one configuration for a given contributed component. So the question arises, if I'm looking for a concept resource owned by ETM component one, do I choose ETM stream one or stream two? And the, the answer to this is it depends on the ordering of these contributions. Now, it's, there are two possible cases here. If ETM stream one and ETM stream two contains the same version of test case, because it hadn't changed between those two streams, I have component SKU, but I don't have version SKU. The same version of that test case will be selected in both of those streams, and that's fine. But it's also possible that ETM stream one and stream two might select different versions of a given test case, in which case, as well as component SKU, I've got version SKU. I now have two possible versions of um, a particular test case, and it's not clear which is the right version um, to, to, be, to be used in this context. And the way to resolve this is that you, you choose the first match to the component based upon the contribution order. And because of that, um, you would choose the version of test case for the first stream that you found. So in this case, assuming that the, uh, the order is as shown, I would choose whatever version of the test case was in ETM stream one and not ETM stream two, because stream one is ordered earlier than stream two. I think this really is my last slide. Yes, it is. Any questions on component skew? Right. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, hello. Hey, uh, could you please give um, a little bit more detail about, um, or with the age cases, um, you know, when do you think uh, this component skew will occur? Because in the global GC or the global component, I have uh, same component of ETM and having two stream. So the question yeah. is why why will you have two stream, right? Well, a, a, a good example is um, think about the aerospace industry for a moment. Um, I, I might have a, a component that makes up an, an, an airplane that's used by multiple um, subsystems. So, for example, I, I might have, you know, let, let's talk about a, a very low level, a, a very fine grained component like a metric bolt. Well, that same metric bolt might be used um, in the wing of the airplane, and it also might be used in um, the jet engine of the airplane. Now, in some industries, let's imagine that there's a requirement to change that bolt in some way, maybe change um, the composition of that bolt. Um, it's, it's possible, I mean, particularly in the aerospace industry, when you make a change to a component that goes into some product like an airplane, there are some very strict regulatory compliance reasons why you may want to change it in one part of the airplane, but not the other parts. Because each time you change where that component is used, there may be a, a certification process you have to go through to demonstrate that the safety of the aircraft is not compromised by that change. So it's very common in the aerospace industry that you might have the same component used in multiple places, but might use different versions of that component in, for example, the engine versus the wing or some other um, component of, of, of the airplane. Um, and, and in those cases, um, you, you may very well, if you have a global configuration representing the entire aircraft, you may very well have different versions of your metric bolt component used. Um, but typically then within the jet engine part, you might have a single version of bolts used. Uh, and in the context of the wing 
um, assembly, you, you might have a different version of, of that bolt. So, um, you know, component skew is, is, is quite common in certain industries, particularly those where making changes to a product has, um, you know, some regu regulatory controls about where you can make the changes. Does, does, that, does that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna move on to the, the primer itself and we're gonna to start to look at some of the, uh, the representation of, of, of the data. Um, David, so I, I do you think you could make this uh, window um, maximized and perhaps uh, increase the font size a little yeah. bit? Is that better? Thank you. Yes, I can make it bigger if, if that if if, if it needs to be. Um, I'm on a 13-inch laptop and I see the text fine. But if anyone wishes, a little uh, bit bigger might be a bit more comfortable. Okay. Bit... okay. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I have the luxury of a high-res monitor, so. <laughs> um, so we'll talk a little bit about version resources first because that is is often at the heart of. You know, configuration management includes versioning, so we ought to talk a little bit about how version resources are represented. Um, so we start off with an example where I, I have um, I have a couple of requirements: requirement A and B, um, and you know if each of them has some kind of identifier and a name and a description, um, and I, I might have a relationship um, between those requirements. I might say. Um, requirement B refines requirement A. I, I might have requirement A being a high level requirement, and I might want to break that down into finer grained requirements. And requirement B might be one of those that then further refines um, requirement A. So we, we have this idea that essentially one of the properties of requirement B is that it's going to refine requirement A. So we'll look at the possible RDF re representation. This is a very simplified view of how we might represent these two requirements. So let's look at requirement A version one. So I, I have, um, uh, this is um, using turtle um, for RDF representation because it's perhaps the easiest to understand. Um, so I, I have a, a requirement A version one and it just has a couple of statements. It says that it's a version resource uh, this RCC config version resource is uh, a defined RDF type in the spec. And it also says DC terms is version of um, requirement A. Um, requirement A is the concept resource. And then against the, uh, the, um, the subject requirement A, the concept URI of, of the requirement, we then say this is a requirement. It has a particular version ID. Um, it's got a, an identifier A, it's got a title and a description and so forth. Um, now, there, there are several important things to notice here. One is that all of the main properties of the requirement are made against the concept resource URI, not the version URI. So requirement A is the concept URI, and this is where the majority of the properties of that requirement are stated. Um, but we also have a couple of statements against the, uh, the version um, resource URI, requirement A V1, where we say it's a version resource and we, we specify um, the concept resource that it's a version of. So let's imagine that, okay, we've got version one of, of this requirement A and we want to make a change to this requirement. Um, in this case, I think I'm just going to uh, change the description. So we end up with version two of the requirement. Um, so this has um, uh, a resource URI requirement A dash V2. Um, and we can see that it has a change description. Um, it still says that it's um, a version of this concept resource, but you notice it also has prov was revision of, and this is simply saying that requirement A version two was a revision of requirement A version one. 
you know, we, we essentially took what was in version one and made a change to it to create version two. Any questions on that before I, I, I move on to the next section? Okay, not hearing any. Now we, we suddenly might have a, um, a representation of requirement B version one. And you can see it follows exactly the same pattern. But remember requirement B was the one where we said that that wants to refine requirement A. So in the RDF, we are using one of the standard properties from the requirements management specification that says requirements B refines and you notice that we're referencing requirement A, which is a concept resource URI, not requirement A version one or version two. And that relates to the PowerPoint slide I had where, where we say we typically reference concept resources rather than version resources. David? Yeah. I have a few questions, if time permits. Yeah, go ahead. So configuration items and configuration artifacts, are those the same things? I think those terms are used in the primer. I think I think those terms are used pretty much interchangeably. Um, configuration items is, is a sort of classic term that you, 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 that you see used when anyone talks about configuration management in sort of very general terms, yes. Right, and then um, is requirement A a concept resource. Yes. But is it correct that we don't explicitly mark it with OSLCCM concept resource class? Correct, correct. There is there is no such class. I see. Thank you. So I, I mean as as with all things um, in RDF in general, uh, any given resource of course can have zero, one or many types. So um, it, it's, it's, you know, here I say requirement A is a requirement. Um, it's quite common also to see that it might be a requirement collection, for example, if you have a look at the, the RM spec, that's very common. If somebody wanted to introduce a new type representing concept resource, um, they could, but I'm not sure that that would, um, that that would be very helpful. Uh, I'm not sure how that would benefit anyone. Um, um, so I, I think if, if somebody came up with a use case where um, there was a need for that, that's something I think that we could look at, but I, I don't think we've come across such a use case yet. Thank you. And I have a question, David. Uh, yeah. Requirement A, uh, can you do reference that? Is that... Uh... Has it, does it have its own URL you can do a get on, for example? Um, I'll Generally, if you're going to do a get on a concept resource, you would typically want to specify a configuration context. Yeah. And, and I'll, I'll, I'm going to come on to that. Um, so if you, if you have a look at the specification, um, it, it's, the specification is, is rather... Um, non-specific about it. It, it, it. it says things like a server might um, reject such a request because you haven't specified a configuration context, or it might, um, if, if you haven't specified a configuration context, it might return you the version of that concept resource in some default configuration context. Um, so um, to some extent, it's, it's um, implementation dependent. It's up to the server to decide whether it wants to support that or whether it absolutely requires a configuration context. But you could have an implementation where it's more of a local node then that you don't have, you cannot do reference or would that be not desired? Well, it's, it's up to, uh, the specification essentially says, but, you know, yeah. there are two possible behaviors. It's, mm -hmm. it's implementation dependent um, <laughs> and therefore a client that makes such a request mm -hmm. um, uh, should not make any assumption about which behavior um, actually applies. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll start to see how configuration context applies, but we, we first of all need to just 
cover how configurations and selections are represented. So let's imagine um, you know, we've got our requirement A. Um, and so what I, I would typically have some kind of requirement stream, a particular configuration for requirements. Um, and here's a representation of a very simple local configuration saying it's a RSLC config stream. Um, it has a title. Um, it references a component. Um, more importantly, it, represents, uh, it references what's called a selections resource. Um, so just by looking at this requirement, you know, if I do a get on this RM stream one, I can't tell just from that information what is the version of requirement A that is selected. But what I can get from that is the selections resource that would allow me to answer that question. So there is a, a, a second resource, RM stream one selections, that will contain um, typically a selects statement to the different versions of requirements that that stream selects. And this example, we can see that it selects uh, requirement A version one. So that's how, that's how um, you, you can look at, at the RDF to determine what is the version of a, a given artifact selected by uh, a particular stream. Now, let's see. David, may so, I ask? So, yeah, go ahead. Two short questions. So first, does a selections uh, resource have a type? And second is, uh, can there be an overlap between two selections, meaning that can yes. one concept resource be into selections? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the answer to your first question, um, does the selection source have a type? It, it, it can optionally have a type, but it's not required to do so. In, in my example here, I've not shown it with an, you know, an RDF type. Um, the specification makes the RDF type optional, so it's, it's not required. But if you do have an RDF type, uh, it ought to be also see config selections. Thank you. Um, as for your second question, well, if you think about it, let's imagine I've got a stream that has 10 requirements in it. Um, typically, when I make a change in, in that stream, um, you know, there'll probably be some previous baseline of that stream that, that has um, probably the same 10 requirements, but different versions. But it's not always the case that you change all of the requirements. Um, so for example, if I've changed two requirements out of the 10, then I, I typically might have a baseline that references 10 requirements, uh, you know, 10 versions of requirements, but my stream might reference eight of the same requirement versions and two, which might be new versions of the two requirements that were changed in that stream compared to the baseline. So it absolutely is very common that the same version resource is likely to appear in multiple selections, that that's perfectly normal. I see, that makes sense, thank you. Now we talked about creating baselines. Um, so let's imagine that we create a baseline of this, of this stream uh, and that might result in RM baseline one. And we have much the same sort of representation. Um, it has a slightly different type, RSLC config baseline. It references a selections resource, um, but we've also got an additional property baseline of stream that says this baseline was created from RM stream one. And the corresponding selections resource would then have the uh, appropriate select statements to reference the version artifacts that were selected uh, from that baseline. So it'll be whatever the stream had selected at the time that the baseline was created. Okay, I'm going to skip over a few things because I'm, I'm aware we're getting tight for time and I do want to just talk a little bit about global configurations. Um, so if I was in a particular stream and I made a change to the requirements to create version two, what would happen is that the requirements stream would be updated to select that version. So the selection statement would now reference requirement A version two 
whereas it was previously selected in version one. Okay, I want to move on to global configurations um, just to try and complete the story. So a global configuration, you remember, is, is a way of aggregating together um, different configurations. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, th this example just fleshes out the example by showing you the RDF representation of a test case and a corresponding um, quality management stream that might select that test case in its selections resource. So I'm going to just move past that. So we saw the idea on the PowerPoint side that you can construct a global configuration that has contributions from um, local configurations. So here's a global stream, and I can see it's of type RSLC config stream, um, and it has contributions from, um, and, and these reference uh, a couple of contribution resources in the same graph. And contribution one says, I got a contribution from RM stream one, and I have a particular contribution order. And I also have a contribution two from QM stream one. So I've, I've now got a global configuration that has a contribution from requirements management as well as uh, test management. And so a user working in this context can now access resources across requirements management stream one and uh, the quality management stream one. And so that's a very simple representation of the global configuration. Any question on questions on that? I have a question on the paragraph that begins from when referencing that requirement. Okay, so this is where, where we, we end up with the configuration context. So you, it's it's this paragraph you mean? Yes, I, if you're going to talk about this, I can hold yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, I was going to, that was the next topic I was going to move move on to. I just wanted to make sure people were happy with this RDF representation of the, the global configuration. And understood its, its meaning as it were. So we, we talked about how an application might want to reference um, a particular concept resource. So we might have um, a test case that validates a requirement. Um, how does the application um, provide a, a reference to that, um, to that requirement? Well, when it's referencing that requirement, um, of course, it'll specify the concept resource of the requirement. So you know, if it wanted to do a get on that URI, you've got the concept resource URI of the requirements, but we need to, it to resolve to a particular version. And we can do that using um, either a query parameter, also see config.context, or a configuration context header value. And the value for, for either of these is the URI of the configuration context. So imagine that we did a get on requirement A and we specified a query parameter, the config context, and yes, I, I know this value should be um, URL encoded, but I've, I've shown it um, non-encoded for, uh, you know, just make it easy to understand. And it's saying, I'm doing this in the context of global stream one. So using that context and the algorithm that we saw previously, um, that would go to the requirements management tool and it would know the concept resource, requirement A, and it would know the configuration context. And therefore it would be able to resolve that to a specific version of requirement A. And what would be returned from the get would be the RTF representation of that version of the requirement. And the, the next part in the primer sort of iterates what, um, repeats what I covered on the slide, that it does that by looking at the tree and resolving it to a local configuration. And then the application knows what is the right version of that requirement um, in that uh, local configuration. <laughs> 
Okay, we're almost at the top of the hour. I don't know whether it's worth, I, there is a UML diagram here, um, but I'm not sure whether, uh, I know some people love UML diagrams. I'm just gonna make it slightly smaller so that it fits on the page a bit better. Um, I know some people love UML diagrams and others hate them, So, to, um, but I thought that might be helpful to try and understand the relationship between these different things. So just to quickly tour through that, and I think we'll then, We've, we've reached the top of the hour. So a, a configuration can typically be of type baseline, stream, or chain set. Um, a configuration is always a configuration of some component. Um, a configuration typically has one, well, it may have zero, one, or many selections. And it's the selections resource that points to, selects um, the version resources in that configuration. And every version resource belongs to a particular component. And a version resource is always a version resource of some concept resource. But the concept resource itself may not exist as a kind of first class object. Um, you know, whether you can do a get of a concept resource or not is not specified in, in the spec. It's left to be implementation dependent. But typically, when you do a get of a concept resource, if it is allowed, what it'll return is a particular version resource of that concept resource. So there isn't really the RDF representation of a concept resource as such. Um, it, it's really a kind of notional um, idea. I was trying to avoid using the word concept again. <laughs> um, it's essentially um, uh, just a way of representing the fact that version resources actually always belong to the same thing. So I, I might have five versions of a requirement. And so essentially there's one concept resource for the requirement and there are five versions of it, that kind of idea. There, there's a lot of other detail in here that I think is probably best that I don't go into um, because otherwise I think we've, well, I've run out of, of time. And I, I think, I think our, our time is up, Andrew. So uh, we might want to just throw it open to any any closing questions? Uh, absolutely. Uh, thank you, David, for this wonderful presentation and uh, so much uh, useful content for, for beginners. Um, as David said, uh, the floor is open for anyone to unmute and ask questions. Um, if questions occur to people afterwards, then Andrew, I assume you're going to provide some means of, of people getting those questions to us so that we can then take them offline? Yes, I've already posted a link in the chat. Okay, okay, excellent. To a forum topic that I've just created where you can ask uh, questions. Um, yeah, I would have a question. Um, just when, uh, when if I, your example, your just previous example uh, was uh, if I call uh, record not A with the global country, then how do my application know about the global configuration? Um, so that kind of relates to, um, let me find the, the slide if I can, Th this kind of slide. How does an application know how to get the contribution tree? Uh, effectively, that it, it, have I understood your question uh, correctly, Fred? Yes, yes. My, so your, your, my application needs to call uh, the global config application. Yes. So, but so at, what, at first, so, uh, at first so, my so, application, at first my application will not be authenticated to that application. Well, obviously, you know, in order for one application to make a request to another application, you, you've, you've got to get past um, getting credentials and effectively uh, logging into that application. But once you've done that. Um, you know, how do I get this hierarchy? Well, one way um, would be I, I know the URI of my configuration context. And so I simply do a get on that URI and I get the RDF representation of GCM stream one, which, which of course is this RDF. Yeah. yeah. And that, that, that gets me the URI of all of the contributed configurations. And then I can do a get on each of these in turn to determine what is the component of that configuration. And if that has any contributions, 
uh, get those and so forth and, and just essentially work um, traversing down the tree, as it were, through doing a series of gets. You know, that, that would be one way of doing it, but obviously has some issues related to scalability and performance. Uh, and so, so uh, within the rational ELM um, application suite, um, we actually do provide a, a service that um, will provide this kind of tree information. And what it does is maintain a local cache because obviously having to do a, a get on these three streams every time you, you, you need the tree uh, doesn't perform or scale well. And so typically, an implementation will want to have some kind of caching mechanism um, so that it can answer that question uh, quickly from local data, local cache data, um, you know, for a period um, uh, so, so that it, it, uh, it performs well. Okay, so, so yeah, but the authentication remains uh, specific, I guess, or you would use the, could we use the, the consumer keys with uh, some sort of TRS users and functional well, user on them? This is really, this is really not specific to config management at all. This is just to OSOC in general. You know, you've got linked data. I've got a resource in application A may reference something in application B, and I, I'm currently I, I'm looking at, um, you know, I, I'm in application A, and application A wants to fetch data from, from application B. Well, obviously, that request, that GET request, has to be authenticated in some way. Yeah, but then the question here, here is not how do I authenticate to, to um, application B, but how does application B get authenticated to, to, you, to the global configuration? Well, if, if I was starting from an application and wanted to go to the global configuration management application, the thing that manages these global configurations, it's exactly the same issue. I, I need to, you know, if I'm in the ELM application, typically I set up friends relationships um, between the, the different applications in, in my JTS. But this is, this is all somewhat um, server implementation specific. You know, the idea of, of friends is... is, is um, Really, a jazz concept rather than mm -hmm. a an OS to C concept. Right, it's an OS concept. Yeah, I mean that's the reason okay. why we 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 have in in um, the ELM applications what why we've got these friends relationships that you you set up so that you know how to do this authentication. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I, I do have another meeting that I, I, I think I, uh, our Jad's had to move across that other meeting. So what I suggest, Andrew, is if we've got any other questions that, that people have, if they can follow that link that you've provided, and then we'll catch up offline with, with those questions and um, provide answers to them. Absolutely. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, thank okay. you again, David, for presenting, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. and. We'll see you next year. The next meeting uh, is on December 23rd, so we will uh, cancel that. And then after that, the 30th of December, we'll skip as well. Yes, I, I can't imagine people being motivated to attend a meeting <laughs> on the 23rd of December.